Hiram, any tips from you on maybe some questions you ask yourself internally or to a junior when making a decision, should I do this thing or not do this thing? What, one of the, the core things, this is tangentially related to your question, but I think it'll, we'll come back to it, it, that came out of writing the book that we didn't expect was a discussion around constraints. Mm-hmm. And the fact that chosen constraints uh, of a system, of an API, right, actually are very powerful. And so the, the question I ask in when we're doing design or when I'm, I'm reviewing a, a change or whatever is, what are the, the constraints that this imposes? Like, how can this be, be abused by people? Hiram's all related issues, right? But what are the constraints that we can use to help guide people to the right set of behaviors as they consume the system or as, we, as they use this thing? A well-chosen set of constraints turns out to make evolvability much easier in a broader software context. It means you can undo some of those decisions that, that Titus was just talking about. It means that you're able to guide people in the right thing, being somewhat subjective, but that it's almost better to have folks doing similar things, like consistent in, even if it's not in the perfect thing. And, and that having appropriate constraints on a system or its evolution are actually really important. So thinking about those constraints if I'm providing infrastructure, if I'm providing a, a system to somebody, right? what are the constraints that I would want to put on them? And oftentimes we think of constraints as like limiting. You know, I can't do things, I'm being constrained. But I think most of, there's lots of constraints we interact with on a regular basis, right? Like traffic signals being a very common one. Very few of us think that red lights are somehow limiting to it. I'm grateful that the red light tells me that I shouldn't go into the intersection and get creamed by the guy going across the way. These are important sets of constraints Uh, in our lives. And if we think carefully about the kinds of constraints in the systems that we're designing, it can be very powerful in providing a long-term sustainable view of the software. Yeah, we, most of the chapters, like we, we seeded it with everyone should talk about time and scale and trade-offs. Almost every chapter surfaced like, oh, and it turns out it's a really good idea for your organization to constrain this. And I know that Hiram's Law is a thing, but it's a lot of a thing for our problem. That was also amusing, but But the constraints thing is counterintuitive because when you're building a product or a platform or something you're like, you're looking for adoption, like you want to support everything, right? And so you try to do everything and that makes sense. But within the bounds of one organization, the more that you can ratchet things down and lock off the less used pieces, like the more flexibility that you will have for changing decisions in the future without having to deal with the fact that one team picked up this exotic dependency on something that you supported, you know, Hiram's law applies there too. And yeah, like uh, it's good for within the bounds of an organization in particular to put as, have as few ways to do anything as reasonable. Yeah, it seems like you'll probably gain a good amount of efficiency, sometimes creativity Mm -hmm. with constraints Mm -hmm. and focus. And that's usually a good thing for humans interacting with a product. And just a quick answer, like just an example, code format. People get very, they view their code format as like a very personal thing. There must be tabs and not spaces. And there must be this many. And the brace goes exactly here. All these kinds of things. Very early on, like we introduced a code formatter. Go had one from the very beginning. We added one for C++ when we started doing a lot of automated changes because we had to format the code to look like a person wrote it. Yeah. And Clang format is our fault. Yeah, Clang format's our fault. That. We had to have um, that in order to get our job. But once you take formatting out of the equation, right? Like people can just write software and the whole part of your brain that worries about where does the variable go? Like, where does the line break go? Does the, does the star go on this side or that side of the name? And that was, like that whole part of your brain can re- be reclaimed for, like doing actual important stuff and not worrying about that kind of thing. Because you've constrained the format of the code and now I don't, I just run a tool and it just does the right thing for me. And I just don't have to worry about it all. Like it turns out that personally, I don't care about any of this stuff. I just want it to be consistent and I want it to work. And those constraints are really powerful in that kind of context. Yeah. Let's use our brain power on tough problems, not where mm-hmm. the semicolon goes.